Good evening, everybody. Welcome. So glad to see so many of you here for what is going to be a fascinating and very timely conversation. Um, we appreciate your being here with us to share in it. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm hosting this uh, program tonight on behalf of the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. It's one of the many virtual programs the museum has offered during COVID. And we've been really thrilled to uh, be able to attract people from all over the world, all over the country, um, to engage in the these fascinating programs and the conversations that ensue um, based on these conversations, uh, on these programs, I should say. So I see many of you already uh, participating in the chat. Thank you for doing that. Continue to do that. Let us know who you are and where you're from. Um, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, but toward the end of the program tonight, we're going to have uh, audience Q&A. And rather than post your question for either Barbara or Megan, or both of them, in the chat, if you could be so kind as to post your question down at the bottom of the screen where you see the words, ask a question, uh, that'll make it a lot easier for us to manage that portion of the program. And also, if you uh, look at the questions that other people have posted and you have the same one, you can upvote it, and that moves it up toward the top of the pile. So um, please take part in that. While we're looking at that part of the screen, I ask you to just raise your eyeballs a tiny bit to that long green bar that talks about how important your support is. Um, throughout the pandemic, we've been really um, just thankful for all the support from everybody uh, out in the community who has um, given what they could to keep these programs going, keep the Mark Twain House and Museum um, supported. And I want you to know that everybody here uh, at the museum and everybody on the Board of Trustees appreciates every single penny um, that you're able to donate and puts it all to very good use. This evening, we're sharing every dollar that is um, contributed or donated uh, with the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, a great community partner of ours. We've done a lot of programs with them over the years, and we're thrilled to be co-sponsoring tonight's program with the World Affairs Council. Um, so uh, know that anything that you donate tonight by clicking that button will be shared equally between the two organizations. I won't talk too much longer because I know you're not here to hear me talk, but I do want to acknowledge, first of all, our sponsors, the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public, WNPR. They sponsor all of our virtual programs, and we're very grateful for that support. Uh, we're also very grateful for the support um, that allows us to produce, produce this uh, program, uh, support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who was a much beloved uh, trustee of the Mark Twain House and Museum, who we unfortunately lost a little while ago, but his legacy lives on um, through these programs and we're delighted to be able to share that with you. Um, if you're enjoying tonight's program and want to participate in others, please check out marktwainhouse.org, our website, where you can check a whole list of upcoming programs. I can tell you there are dozens and dozens of them lined up for the coming months, a whole variety, and you won't want to miss any of them. So please uh, take a look at what we, the museum has to offer. And I would like to tell you that tonight's book, How Civil Wars Start, and very importantly, and how to stop them, is available for purchase. There's a link in the chat um, that allows you to order a signed copy of the book. Um, and uh, not only do you get a signed copy if you order through clicking that link, but you also have the benefit of knowing that your purchase supports the Mark Twain House and Museum. So we're very grateful for that too. So I'd like to now introduce uh, our speakers tonight, starting with our moderator, uh, Megan Torrey, a CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Uh, Megan oversees the development and delivery of world-class programming that educates the community about global affairs. Recently, Megan implemented a nationwide World Affairs Council series focused on global women's health, helped pilot a leadership mission to Brazil, and produced a mini documentary about Henry Kissinger that featured several former secretaries of state. Megan holds degrees in international relations and diplomacy, and her research interests include inclusive security and the role of women in post-conflict situations and citizen participation in foreign policy. Megan is going to be in conversation with Barbara F. Walter, uh, who is the Rohr Professor of International Affairs at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego, and one of the world's leading experts on civil wars, political violence, and terrorism. 
Her books include the award-winning Committing to Peace, Why Negotiations Fail, Reputation and Civil War, and Civil Wars, Insecurity, and Intervention. She's a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a frequent live guest on CNN, and an active consultant for the World Bank, the United Nations, and the Departments of Defense and State. In her spare time, she occasionally writes for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Los Angeles Times. So please join me in giving a great big World Affairs Council and Mark Twain House and Museum welcome to Barbara Walter and Megan Torrey. Um, give me just a moment, please, to bring them both up on screen. Takes just a moment. Megan and Barbara, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, and my goodness, uh, I got a little bit embarrassed for myself reading all your credentials. I want to go and uh, uh, try to achieve something important in my no. spare time. <laughs> So I'm going to sit back and relax and enjoy your conversation uh, along with the rest of our audience. But um, I, I think we're going to take some audience questions toward the end. Um, Megan, will you bring me back up when it's time to do that? Absolutely, Jennifer. It'll be my pleasure to uh, welcome you back and, and hear from our audience tonight. Very good. Well, thank you both for being here and enjoy. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. And thank you to the Mark Twain House for um, having us for this program tonight. Barbara, I am so excited to talk to you. <laughs> so it seems every, everywhere, every time we turn on the news, there's something else we're hearing popping up about civil war, right? So, I mean, here in Connecticut, we have Ray Dalio, who just wrote that book, say, you know, saying there's a high, high percentage of uh, the possibility of going to civil war. We have the professor in uh, Canada, Homer Dixon, who was warning the, you know, sounding the bells to Canada saying, hey, everyone, Canada needs to prepare for um, when the United States has its second civil war and we're going to accept conflict refugees yeah. north of the border. And then I think yesterday or just within the last day or two, um, Congressman Adam Kinzinger was on CNN saying we're naive if we're not thinking about the possibility. Yeah. But it's yeah. so deeper than that, right? Yes. Yes. And, and so you're an expert in civil war and its roots and causes and global conflict. Um, so let's just start. Why did you write this book? Why did why was it urgent to do it now? Yeah. So um, I, five years ago, it never occurred to me to write this book. Uh, and I've been studying civil wars for 30 years. <laughs> um, and, you know, for the last 30 years, I've been focused on conflicts in uh, in Syria, in Northern Ireland, in uh, Cambodia and Mozambique. My focus was everywhere but the United States. Um, and then in 27, between 2017 and 20, the end of 2021, I got invited to serve on a task force run by the US government. It's called the Political Instability Task Force. It's actually run through the, the CIA. Um, and I was brought in as, as a consultant. And the job of the task force and people like me was to come up with a predictive model to help um, the US government um, try to predict what countries around the world um, were likely to fall apart or at least experience significant political instability and potentially civil war. Um, and so we would get together four times a year. We'd sit in a hotel conference room in DC and we talk about all the things that we thought might be important. And we put these factors into a predictive model. So things like poverty, things like income inequality, how diverse the country was. We put over 30 factors into this model that we had developed. And only two, only two of all of these factors came out highly predictive. And it was not what we were expecting. We were quite surprised by this. And the two factors were, the first one was something that we called anocracy. And that's just a fancy term for a government that's a, a partial democracy. It's neither fully democratic, it's neither fully autocratic. It has elements of, of both. Um, and the second factor was whether citizens in these countries began to organize themselves politically around religion, ethnicity, or race. So rather than form political parties around ideology, like 
that's the norm. Are you, you know, are you a conservative party? Are you a liberal party? Are you a communist party? Are you something else? Um, they people the citizens start grouping themselves based on identity, and it's and it's not just that, but then these parties seek to gain political power, not to share it with other ethnic groups or religious groups, but to exclude them all. So I'm sitting in Washington, D.C. I'm in a conference room. We are not allowed to talk about the United States. We never mention the United States. Legally, we are not allowed to say anything or focus on or look at the United States. So we're talking about Africa. We're talking about Central Asia. We're talking about the Middle East. And it's 2018. And I've been watching what's happening in the United States. And I'm realizing that these two factors, the two factors that we know put countries at a high risk of civil war. If countries around the world have these two factors, the US government puts them on an official watch list and watches them um, because they expect that, that instability and or violence is likely to occur in the near future. So. I know about the watch list. I know about these warning signs. I'm looking at my country and, and this is what I started to see as a private citizen. I see that the US, US's democracy is declining. Um, the same nonprofit organization that measures democracy, um, uh, that, that the measure that we use for the task force downgraded the United States for the first time in 2016. So it went from being, you know, the 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 strongest and and most liberal type of democracy to something less than that. It downgraded the United States again in 2019, and by the end of the Trump administration, um, it was downgraded for the first time since 1800 to an anocracy. It was actually an anocracy, and then I started looking at the United States in terms of the second factor you know or do we have parties developing here that are based mainly on race ethnicity and or religion as opposed to ideology and that has also been happening back in 2000 as as late as 2008 white americans were equally likely to vote for the democratic party as they were for the republican party and um, when Obama got elected, that started to shift. The white working class, which had traditionally found its home with the Democrats, because the economic policies pursued by the Democrats were more beneficial to them, they started gravitating to the Republican Party to the point where um, today the Republican Party is 90% white. So by the definition that we used on the task force, when we're looking at countries outside of the near United States, um, the Republican Party is what we call an ethnic faction, and ethnic factions are are one of the risk factors um, for civil war. And so I, I was watching this happen, and I I couldn't not relay this information to the American public. So can, so you just said that the U.S. was downgraded for the first time since the Civil War to an anocracy. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it means for a government to function in this in this state of anocracy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then maybe where we fall on the uh, polity scale, right? Yeah. And who might? So who are some of our neighbors? Where in the world are we yeah. launching? Like where where are we sitting right now? Yeah. So Megan, tell me if this gets too technical, because, uh, you know, my heart, I'm a professor and I can, I, you know, tell me when I get too much in the weeds. So the way the nonprofit that that measures um, anocracies is called the Center for Systemic Peace. It's located in Virginia. It's been around forever. Every year uh, it, it looks at every single country around the world. It's done this since the, the late 1700s. It has measures um, and, and it gives a score for, um, you know, how democratic or autocratic a government is. And it has this anocracy scale. It's, it's actually called the polity scale. And it goes from negative 10, which is the most democratic countries in the world. Um, the most democratic countries in the world are Saudi Arabia, um, Bahrain, North Korea. So the least, you, no, the, the most autocratic, the most, most autocratic. autocratic. So you do not want to be in that group. <laughs> the negative tens, that's bad. 
Um, on the other side are the positive tens. These are the most democratic countries in the world. These are the Denmarks, the Icelands, the Switzerlands, the Canadas. The United States was a plus 10 for much of its history. That's where you want to be. If you are between negative five and positive five, so it's this middle zone, you are an anocracy. You are a partial democracy. If you're close to the negative five, you have more autocratic features with a few democratic features. If you're a positive five, you have more democratic features with a few authoritarian things mixed in. Um, so the United States in, in 2015 <laughs> was a positive 10. We'd been there for quite a long period of time. Uh, most Americans think that's where we always are and, and that's where we still are. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, so the Center for Systemic Peace in 2016 downgraded us to a um, plus eight. Um, and the reason they downgraded us, there was lots of different reasons, but one of the big reasons was that we had international election monitors. They come to the United States every time we have an election. Uh, they go all over the world. They do this everywhere. Um, and their job is to determine if our elections are free and fair. And their assessment of the 2016 elections here in the United States was that they were free, but they were not entirely fair. There was partisan meddling in uh, in the elections. There was Russian meddling via social media in the elections. And so um, this is, if you don't have totally fair elections, this is not a really the ideal democracy. We were downgraded. We were downgraded again in um, 2019. <clears throat> um, and that was a result of the executive branch, the White House, not, not responding to congressional subpoenas. So again, most Americans probably don't know this. When the founding fathers set up our democracy, we had these three branches. The three branches were supposed to be equally powerful, equally weak, right? They were going to be checked by each other. But our executive branch has been getting more powerful than all the other branches. And that's been happening for decades. Um, and when the Trump administration refused to even respond to the subpoenas, and that is the main check by the legislative branch on the White House, on the executive branch, when the White House refused to even acknowledge that and Republicans in the Senate went along with that, that downgraded us further. That is a just clear indication that our executive branch in some ways is too powerful. It's not, it's not necessarily that it's running amok, but it has the capacity to run amok. And we got downgraded. And then by the end of the Trump administration, that's when we went to plus five. And that was the result of a sitting president refusing to accept the results of, elect of an election and attempting to overturn the results. And that clearly, um, you know, if you have a president who doesn't respect the peaceful transfer of power and doesn't respect elections, um, that is that is not a full democracy. So given the two factors you laid out, anocracy and, and factionism. So we oftentimes look at ourselves as saying, oh, we're so polarized. We're so polarized. But you make a very big distinction between polarization. Yes. In fact, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about that and why? Um, you know, factions are, are so different and so dangerous. Yeah. So when, when people say the word polarization, they're talking about ideology. Um, so you and I could be politically polarized. I could be a rabid conservative. I could believe in, um, you know, absolute free market principles, um, a, a small social safety net, you know, and a whole series of conservative principles. You could be a rabid liberal who believes in exactly the opposite. Um, and if you have a country that's divided that way, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not particularly easy to govern, but those countries don't tend to turn on themselves and try to kill each other. Um, what's different about ethnic factionalism, when you, when you start to have parties that are based on you being white and me, for example, being Latino or you being Christian and me being Muslim, um, <clears throat> there's no shifting. What, it, what hap tends to happen is it locks people in to parties and there's nowhere for them to go. So it becomes particularly intransigent 
And, and oftentimes when you have parties like that, it's based on this, this form of virulent nationalism, which is, which is that a particular ethnic group or particular religious group deserves to rule and and there's a predatory aspect of it there's like we form a party around a particular ethnicity or religion because we believe that that's the religion that should be in charge and if you believe that then what those parties often do is they aggressively try to break down democracy and they and and they aggressively try to ensure that no one else outside of their religion or their ethnicity or their race gets to rule and this creates a situation that's really combustible so <clears throat> this combustible situation uh, can we talk about that the accelerator yeah. to that situation right um, yeah. we now live in a world where we're surrounded by social media and can you talk about the role social media plays um, perhaps in in, in in civil wars? And I think that there's some some great examples, but um, how, how, how does social media fit into all of this? Yeah. So I'll tell you that we have very strong hunches, but we have we have no hard evidence yet um, that there's a causal link between social media and any of these negative societal effects that we've been seeing in the last 10 years but i suspect over the next five years we will um we will see and the reason we have no hard evidence is that social media companies like facebook are not releasing any of their data um but what we do know is that when whistleblowers like francis haugen who um you know she emerged back um in december um and released tens of thousands of pages of facebook um, research showing that Facebook knows that it's having all these negative effects. Um, but this is what we suspect. For almost the last hundred years, for almost the entire 20th century, the world was becoming more democratic every year, almost every year. It was literally a century of democratization. Um, and, and this pattern was so strong and it was so long lasting that the assumption of, of most scholars and most average citizens was that democracy was just gonna continue to spread throughout the world until everybody was eventually a democracy. That was just one of those, you know, that, like one of the conventional wisdoms. And then it stopped in 2010. Democracy reached its peak around the world in 2010. And since then, almost every year, it has been declining. There are more and more countries around the world becoming um, aut autocratic, authoritarian regimes than, than democratic regimes. And this is not just happening in like the fledgling democracies like um, Turkey or, or Hungary. It's happening in the most liberal democracies like the United States and the United Kingdom. And this has never happened before. And so, and in fact, there's there's a Swedish institute that studies democracy. It's called the VDEM, <coughs> Varieties of Democracy. And they they actually put out a report last year that that called 20, the year 2020 the year of autocratization. So we are in this fundamentally different phase than we have been for over a century. And it turned in 2010. So you're like, what has happened? What, like, what is driving this? And of course, one of the things that happened is we had this radical change in technology in the mid 2000s. Um, <clears throat> you know, around 2006, you had, um, you know, increased usage of, of the smartphone and you had, you know, people relying more heavily on news from social media as opposed to traditional media outlets. And, and what that did is it broke down an important gatekeeping role that traditional media had for people who wanted to spread disinformation and misinformation. So if you were Putin in the year 2000, you know, Putin was in power. Uh, I think he was in power. If you're Putin, your main external en enemy are the liberal democracies of Western Europe and North America, right? These, these countries always make you look bad. In, in Putin's world, you would like to see these countries 
become unstable. You would like to see their democracies weaken. In the year 2000, there's nothing Putin can do. Nothing. We're more powerful than him militarily. He can't, he can't do anything to us. If it's the year 2015, what do you do? You do exactly what Putin did. He's he's he has skyscrapers outside of St. Petersburg that are filled 24/7 with young people whose job and is to spread disinformation about democracy in places like Sweden and Germany and France and Britain and the United States. Um, you know, these their job is to to convince Americans that we don't agree on vaccinations, that we don't agree on diversity. You know, their job is to find wedge issues and just push and push and push and push. Um, and there's nothing to stop him. It is the backdoor way for enemies of democracy uh, and, and for enemies of, of countries, you know, whose societies they want to destabilize is a backdoor way for them to do that. So just how close, how close do you think the United States is to <laughs> the potential of having a civil war? Um, so on the task force, if you have these two factors, um, we know that you have about a 4% annual risk of civil war. That sounds like it's not a lot, but it actually is a lot. That's, <clears throat> so if those two factors continue year after year after year, that adds up. Um, so if those two factors remain for 30 years, the chance of a civil war is over 100%. Over 100%. It's going, it's going to happen. Um, it's like smoking. If, uh, if I started to smoke today, my risk of dying of lung cancer or some um, smoking related disease this year would be very, very low. But if I continue to smoke for the rest of my life, 30, 40, 50 years, the likelihood that I died of something related to smoking was, is going to be high. And that's where the United States is. So, you know, one of the one of the motivations for me to write this book is, geez, we know the warning signs and we have time. Like right? if we if we reform our democracy, if the Republican Party decides that it's actually going to represent um, not not just white Christians, but but the whole mix of people who are who are Americans, then our then our risk disappears. But if they double down, if they double down and they 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 continue to try to undercut our democracy, and if they continue to double down with with a a strategy that appeals to only one ethnic and religious segment of our society, then our risks increase every single year. So with this increase, so what would a civil war in the United States look like? <laughs> yeah, so this is, that's a great, thank you for asking that question. Uh, I think one of the reasons why a lot of Americans have a hard time getting their mind around this, and one of the reasons why they're, they're more complacent than they should be, um, given, given these factors, is that they're thinking that the second civil war will look like the first civil war. That they're thinking about an 1860s version of a civil war and modern civil wars do not look like that at all. And they especially don't look like that if they're fought against governments with really powerful militaries like you have in the United States. Um, uh, it, the next civil war is not gonna be two large armies meeting each other on a battlefield the, they're going to be soldiers wearing uniforms, dragging cannons. That is not what it's going to look like. It's going to be more like an insurgency. It's going to be fought using unconventional tactics, domestic terrorism. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be decentralized. You're going to have militias around the country. Sometimes they'll coordinate their behavior. Sometimes they'll act alone. Um, it's going to be more like a siege of terror. So think about what um, what Britain experienced um, for decades with the IRA. Think about what Israel experienced, um, you know, both in the first and se second intifada with um, um, with Hamas. Uh, you know, these groups do not want to face British soldiers or Israeli soldiers. That is a losing strategy. 
Um, so they're going to take they're going to take the war to civilians. They're going to take the war to um, to infrastructure. They're going to you know they're going to target IKEAs and they're going to target you know public spaces and they're going to target you know the electrical grid and and um, and they're going to target you know minority groups and. And, you know, what they're trying to do is so fear and create a sense of um, insecurity and intimidation where people really don't know who's in charge and then everything just kind of shuts down. So in your book, you make this point that all too often some people don't even realize they're in a civil war until conflict has already started. In yeah. Around you. Um, in wanting to prevent that, right, and wanting to understand how we stop civil wars. Um, what are you lay out a really good roadmap of specific suggestions on how we can prevent a civil war in the United States? Um, yeah, and you, yeah, and you talk about the conflict trap. Um, so maybe maybe talk about those two yeah. um, in in how we might yeah. prevent this from happening here, having a, a second civil war in the U.S. Yeah. So I've interviewed a lot of people who lived through um, wars in places like Sarajevo and Baghdad um, and Belfast and and um, and and I and I asked them all the same question, like, what was it like leading up to it? Like, like, what were the warning signs? When did you know that something had really shifted? And most of them say the exact same thing. They said we had no idea. They said, you know, in retrospect, there were these warning signs, but but we we didn't take them seriously. We thought they were isolated incidences. And to be honest, we were, you know, we were busy just getting on with our daily lives. We were having kids and we were, you know, finishing our degrees and we were, um, you know, <laughs> cooking dinner, right? Where, you know, life was busy. And, and when things happened, it, you know, the people who were behind it had always had an explanation. You know, they, they, it, you know, they told us, don't pay any attention. Everything's going to be fine. Um, and, and that's why they were surprised one, because they were busy and two, because the, the, the individuals who are, who are actually pushing for war want to distract you. They, they don't want you to, to pay attention. Um, and so, you know, again, it, you know, what talking to them, they're like, we wish we had known. And so, you know, as I'm sitting on this task force, I'm like, we do know, we know the warning signs, right? And if we can get this message out to the American public that, you know, you have, you cannot allow your democracy to decline. Um, you know, you it's it's not that you're you you worry about becoming North Korea. The United States isn't going to become North Korea. It's that you're going to get in this middle zone, and most Americans don't even know of the middle zone. And 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 if you talk about the middle zone, they're like, well, that doesn't sound really that dangerous, but it is. It's dangerous. You can't let your democracy decline. So strengthen your democracy, and we have time to do that. But if you're if you're going to allow your your leaders to take it in the other direction, then you should you should understand how how risky this is. And and of course we know that that forming a party that only represents one segment of society. We you know the United States is a multi ethnic, multi racial, multi religious country. It's also a two party system, and one of our parties, one of the two parties essentially only represents white Christians. I mean, that's a problem in a country that is that is so diverse and is becoming even more diverse. So, um, so you know, we know what to do. Um, and then of course we could talk about social media in the book, I, I, I call it the accelerant. It is the accelerant. It, it makes it easier for, for people who, who wanna undercut democracy to help undercut it. It makes it easier for people who wanna divide divide populations and divide societies to, to do that. It makes it easier for ethnic entrepreneurs to play on fear and xenophobia and create, you know, and create these, um, these divisions. Um, you know, the easiest thing that the United States could do is just regulate social media. I mean, the, the, we have, you know, every, we, radio, television, everything's regulated for a reason. And, and now we have this, this media, 
this vast media empire where most Americans get their news. That is, that is the wild west. And, and we're starting to see all the negative social implications that it has. So, you know, that would be, that would be a, a pretty easy, easy fix. And then of course, you know, the, the biggest, <clears throat> the biggest thing is, you, you know, people, hmm, sort of nasty politicians, that's not a good word. That's, let me be more specific. Ambitious politicians who want power at all costs. Um, the only way they get that in a democracy is if people allow them to take that power. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, Americans have to, have to, they have to fight for, for, you know, popular sovereignty. They have to fight for, for their right to vote. They have to, they have to demand um, that their politicians, um, um, that the the, poli the policies of the politicians reflect what the people want and not what you know big corporations want or what or what a minority of of individuals um, who who can either donate or who live in rural state want states want. So it's, that's you know that's not a democracy. And so people people need to demand that um, that their politicians um, respond to them. And of course, the way they do that is, is through peaceful protests. And we, there's great, great research, a lot of it coming from a woman at the Kennedy School at Harvard, Erica Chenoweth, about the power of peaceful protests. If people start going out in the street and demanding that politicians listen to them, um, I, I think the slide uh, away from democracy um, will, will stop and we'll, we'll have. Um, you know, we will actually get reform. So I'm going to bring Jennifer in in just a second, but um, and I'll ask you to make this a summarize it any way you want. In this last chapter, there is there was a great example of hope, and it was yeah. when, you, when you were asked to look at um, where you thought any when you were studying where you thought civil war would break out, and you thought for sure it was yeah. in, it was going to be in South Africa. And it's yeah. Not for the world to look look to and for the world to look up towards leadership. And so can you yeah. talk about what happened in South Africa yeah. and how can learn lessons from, from that situation? So when I was in college in the mid 1980s, um, I was already talking about civil wars and I was taking a class and, and in the class, um, the professor asked, where, where around the world do you think a civil war is most likely to break out? And everybody in the class said the same thing, South Africa. It was obvious. And the professor agreed with us. I mean, it was so obvious that here we had a country that was, that was barreling, barreling towards civil war. Um, it was an anocracy. Um, it clearly had ethnic factions. It, the, the apartheid regime was your extreme example of a, uh, a, a white minority government that was excluding every other group um, in society. And not only that, as um, black South Africans began to protest, the apartheid regime doubled down. And instead of reforming, instead of allowing blacks to have more of a voice, they sent soldiers into the street and started mowing down everybody, including school children. Um, and so, you know, we just thought, there, there's no, the only end to this if, is if this, the majority, the, the black population, which is huge compared to, to the white population, they will eventually have to turn to violence because nothing else is working. And then it changed, which is like blew everybody away. And, and what happened was that the apartheid regime kicked out Botha, who is this tried and true, uh, racist apartheidist, and they brought into power de Klerk. De Klerk was no, um, you know, wonder man, um, but his, they brought him into power with the expressed purpose of, okay, negotiate with the black majority. Um, they released Nelson Mandela from prison and quite quickly, the, uh, the, the, the minority white government transferred power to the black majority. Oh my God, this is crazy. Why did they do this? And there was a, a, you know, a bunch of reasons why they did that. But, but one of the big reasons was that the white business community eventually withdrew their support from the apartheid regime. 
right? And this is where the money was in South Africa. And the white business community withdrew its support, not because they suddenly became moral and suddenly had a conscience, but because the economic sanctions that the US and the European community and Japan, the three biggest trading partners with South Africa, um, those economic sanctions were strangling South African businesses. And the white business community realized that they could either have profits or they could have apartheid, but they could not have both. And they picked profits and they told the white minority regime, no more, we're not supporting you. You have to transfer power um, or you're on your own. And they understood that that was, that was their main bulwark. And if they lost the business community, they were, could not sustain themselves. And, and so they transferred power. Um, and yeah, and, and, and the, the civil war that, everybody thought for sure was going to happen didn't happen and so let's hope that we're on a similar path i'm going to ask jennifer to come back because i know that our audience members have a lot of questions and i want to make sure that we get a chance to hear from them as well yes <laughs> my goodness um i i'm a little bit speechless because i've just been wrapped and and so engaged in listening to the two of you talk and my my, my mind is just kind of reeling with thoughts um i am going to invoke host privilege as i so often <laughs> do and ask a question first because barbara in your book you do talk uh, uh, briefly but but um importantly about the concept of civic education and um oh, what yeah. we seem to be one of the key components, as far as I can tell, in our society, American society, is this <laughs> lack of understanding of civil yeah. discourse, of being able to express our views respectfully and accepting yeah. other people's views with respect. And um, I, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about how that plays into this entire phenomenon that we're uh, focusing on this evening and yeah. whether maybe uh, improving our uh, powers of civil discourse might help avert the next civil yeah. war. Yeah, so it used to be that civics education was part of the traditional education for kids in the United States. And civics education was really teaching kids how our government works, how power is divided, who has power, how, you know, how bills or how laws are made. Um, and that has been cut consistently over the years in, in, in large part to make room for, for an overwhelming emphasis on STEM. Um, and, um, and, and at the time, I'm sure people thought this is, you know, if you had to choose between, you know, math or, or civics, well, you'd want, you'd want to train your kids in, in math. But what we're now seeing is, or the repercussions of that is, is that many Americans don't have any idea how our government works. And that means they don't know who has power, how they have power and how they can wield power. And if you don't know how power is divided in the country and you don't know how much power you have and how you can use that power, it makes it really, really easy for nefarious people. People want to be, you know, dictators to take that power away from you um and we have a complicated system and and again you know when you look at countries that democracies that decline if you look at hungary you know these are uh, erdogan was a popularly elected president and then very slowly and systematically and very kind of craftily he starts to he starts to eliminate some of the guardrails of democracy and 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 nobody said anything and and if you don't understand what those guardrails are and you don't understand why they're important then you will allow somebody to do this and before you know it suddenly the you know suddenly that that individual has enormous power and suddenly you're helpless to do anything about it. And suddenly you have a very di different system than what you used to have. So civics education is incredibly important. And I'm, I'm going to recommend a book to your, your listeners. There's, um, there's a, a guy in Seattle, Eric Liu, who has spent his career um, trying to strengthen the U.S. democracy, trying, trying to, to strengthen civil 
discourse, discourse, civic education. And he's a brilliant speaker and he's a brilliant writer. He's written many books, but the book I recommend um, people read, it's short, it's beautifully written. It's called You Are More Powerful Than You Think. And, you know, his conclusion after years of, of advocacy is <clears throat> that Americans need to understand and need to take their power back. And this book very, very clearly lays out how to do that. So you are more powerful than you think. Thank you so much for that, Barbara. That's really helpful. And, and I hope we'll all take that to heart because uh, the more we can converse and, and um, talk honestly and directly with, with one another, I think the better off we'll all be. And with that in mind, we've got a bunch of questions now. Um, so Pamela Benchian has a very big question. How, and somebody else has voted this up too, how specifically do we stop the decline of democracy? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's two ways to do it from the top down to the bottom up. And if it happens from the top down, that is when you have bipartisan support, um, in Washington, uh, between the president and Congress for reform. So you would eliminate the, the you know, Republicans, and Democrats would get together. They would agree to eliminate the filibuster. <laughs> they would, um, <clears throat> they would agree, for example, to implement an independent committee to run the U.S.'s elections, to take it out of the hands of local political parties. There's a whole, we know all the undemocratic features in our democracy. Our leadership in Washington, both Democrats and Republicans, know all the undemocratic features in our government, and they could agree to get rid of them. And that would strengthen our democracy and, and we our, our risk of civil war would basically disappear. But we know that is not going to happen. In fact, the Republicans are going in the opposite direction. They don't want to reform our democracy. In fact, they want to cement in advantages for minority rule because if you're a party that only or essentially only represents white Christians, that is a declining demographic in the United States. You are, um, you know, you are a minority of the voters and you're going to become even more so. So they're going in the opposite direction. They actually don't want democracy. They don't want a system where one person, one vote exists because they can't win in that system. So it's not going to come from the Republicans and it's not going to come from the Democrats because we, we have seen with with mansion and cinema that they they don't have the votes and with the filibuster they don't have the votes to get any reform so that is off the table that means that reform at least in the current situation we're in has to come from the bottom up um and we know historically that that um one of the best ways that governments will agree to reform is if they look at outside the window and they see mass protests. Think about the Arab Spring. And these were authoritarian governments. Um, you know, Mubarak in, in Egypt was in power for decades. Ben Ali in Tunisia was in power for decades, right? Th these guys didn't actually have to reform. There was, there was no impetus for them to reform from the top. But it only took a matter of weeks of mass protests for them to be forced to resign. So, so people underestimate the power of mass protests. And, and we know that reform isn't going to come from the top down um, because we have one party that doesn't want it, and we have another party is, who's incapable of, of pushing through reform. That means it's going gonna, it's gonna to rest on the American public. So I, I hesitate even to say this as response, but that almost sounds like an argument for civil war. If the government no 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 has, no <laughs> peaceful uh, protests are not civil. No okay. no, it's the opposite of civil okay. war. So think about um, you know if you think about Tahir Square in Egypt, these were peace. You know these are people that they have a cell phone and they have a a sign. Right, nobody's got guns. Um, think about um, the civil rights, you know, think about Martin Luther King and, you know, these are marches, these were peaceful, peaceful marches. Um, and, and in fact, we know that the peaceful protests are far more successful in gaining reform and gaining concessions than protests that, that spin, 
and and become violent. No, no, no. I mean, there's a huge literature on on how do you engage in in peaceful protests? How do you do that in the most effective way? And you know, Martin Luther King, of course, was was a master master of that and maintaining that peacefulness. Right? That never, you know, the violence came from from the government side. It didn't come from the protesters. No, oh, thank thank you for clarifying that. That's really an important point. So thank you. Mark Anderson says, what effect, if any, does the increasing wealth gap play in the decline of democracy? Can you talk about that? Yeah. So uh, again, you know, we looked a lot at income inequality. Um, I can tell you that the research on, on the, the, the relationship between income inequality and civil war is mixed. Some of it finds that it increases the risk. Some of it finds that it does nothing. Some of it actually finds that it decreases the risk. So if, if you're a, if you're a researcher, you're like, what do you do with that? And what we're starting to see in the most recent studies is <clears throat> is that if it, the the biggest factor is not income inequality, the biggest factor are groups who who are were once in power and are losing power or have recently lost it. So it's okay. it's this loss of political power, not the loss of not not poverty or 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 big wealth divides. But what we're start, starting to see in the most recent um, studies is that if you have these groups who are who are in decline politically, and they also experience some sort of economic crisis. Um, those are the groups that are most likely to start a civil war. So if you think about, you know, whites here in the United States, they are what what uh, researchers like me call sons of the soil and sons of the soil tend to start civil war. They're groups that had once been dominant in a country politically, culturally, economically, and they're they're losing they're losing power it's often because of demographic changes um, but if you also look at who has suffered disproportionately as a result for example of, of globalization it's been the white working class they're the ones who have lost a lot of the once well-paying manufacturing jobs if you look on a host of measures suicide rates um, um, divorce rates you know um, uh, life expectancy. It's the white working class that has actually um, declined on these measures more than Latinos, uh, African Americans, and, and Asians. They, you know, at worst, they've they've remained the same. But it's the white working class that that has also suffered this sort of economic decline as well. And again, if we were to look at a group like this in in the Philippines or or in India. Um, or, or somewhere else, we would be like, okay, that's the group. That's the group that's gonna start the war. Wow, that's fascinating too. Thank you so much. And thank you for that really good question. Um, so here's another really good question. Uh, how do we get the large proportion of eligible voters who don't vote to vote? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know yeah. something, I mean, um, so political scientists call it the ground game. Uh, the ground game is you you knock on people's doors. You go door to door and you knock on people's doors before the election. You you arrange rides to help them get to the polls. Um, you make voting easier, right? You you get rid of all of the obstacles that that um, for the most part, where the Republican Party has put in place a, in in terms of making voting more difficult and easier. Um, but a ground game is really important, um, and for reasons I don't entirely understand, um, you know, neither party, but especially Democrats, are not really great at the ground game. Part of it probably is it's it's expensive, it's it's labor intensive. You got to organize a lot. Um, but Stacey Abrams in Georgia, I mean. The reason why we have two senators, two Democratic senators from Georgia today is because Stacey Abrams was an absolute whiz in terms of mobilizing a great ground game and she got out the vote. And, and that's, you know, we had almost 80 million voters who didn't vote in the last election and we had historically high turnout in 2020. How do you get those 80 million um, voters out? You, you use the strategy that Stacey Abrams did. You, you knock on doors and you, you just, you know, persist. That's a great answer. Thank you. 
So we're getting close to, to time to end. I want to ask two more questions from the audience. Um, one of them from Michael Vanderpool. Um, and this one probably will be complicated, but he says, if the United States of America finds itself officially in a civil war or realistically in the near future or next years, is the plan or protocol to prevent or resolve that um, conflict yeah. in the most efficient and ethical, effective manner? Thanks no, you want to, Michael. Yeah, you want to prevent, prevent, prevent. So I, the, the first half of my career was devoted to how do you resolve civil wars, not about why they start. And the reason I, I focused on how you resolve them is because civil wars are longer than any other type of war. They resist settlement. They tend to be fought to the death. Once they start, they're really, really hard to end. Mm. So you want to pre prevent them. It's much easier to prevent them than it is to stop them once once people start start killing each other. And of course, we know what, you know, strengthen your democracy, right? Um, reform your system, uh, you know, ex you know, open up your party to a wider variety of people. In, uh, and I mean, that's a whole lot easier to do than to, to, to rebuild a country once it's turned on itself. That's that's kind of optimistic. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm going to give Judith, our audience member, the, the last question here, because I think it's something that's on all of our minds, having uh, engaged in this fascinating conversation and challenging and thought-provoking conversation. How, uh, what can each of us as an individual uh, with a busy life do to help? What can we do? Thanks, Judith, for asking that. Um, pay attention. Um, don't, you know, when you see, you know, we're going to, we're going to be facing, um, elections where, where probably some of our politicians are going to want to do things that are illegal and, or if they're not illegal, they're breaking, you know, norms of democracy that have been around for hundreds of years. Don't let them do this. Don't don't stand by and stay silent. Um, uh, you know, organize protests. Um, volunteer to help with the ground game and to help get people out to vote. You know, if those 80 million eligible voters vote in the next election, the makeup of of the House and the Senate is probably going to be quite different and and we might have a situation where reform is possible so you know i i think the the worst thing you can do is just to be complacent we you know we have to be vigilant we have to be aware we have to be paying attention we have to be willing to take um various forms of peaceful peaceful action but we have to let our politicians know that that we are watching and we're going to hold them accountable Thank you for that. Megan, would you add anything as a representative of the World Affairs Council? What would you say to that? No, I mean, I always say engage, arm yourself with knowledge, become the best citizen that you can be, and you know, spread the word to your friends. If we're all participating, if we're all gaining knowledge, if we're all working together in partnership like the World Affairs Council is tonight with the Mark Twain House, we're better informed. And when we go to those polls, we make more informed decisions. So you know, stay involved and stay engaged. Thank you both. And I, I would add that, you know, just a simple thing is taking part in a program like tonight's program, yeah. spending an hour thinking uh, hard about these issues. That's got to make a difference. And the next time you go out in the world and are having a conversation with somebody, maybe that'll come into play. So I want to really thank our, our audience tonight. Um, I want to thank you both, Megan and Barbara, for sharing so much with us. And I really want to encourage people, if you weren't convinced at the beginning of this program, <laughs> to purchase this book um, and, and read it and bookmark it and uh, fold down pages, uh, the, the corners of pages. Um, my colleague Alice has posted uh, the link once again in the chat, so you can click on that. And remember that um, unlike if you order elsewhere, you get a signed copy if you um, or, uh, order through us and you're supporting the Mark Twain House through your purchase. Um, I hope that you both will um, be back and uh, 
uh, Don't Be Strangers to the Mark Twain House. Uh, and um, we're so delighted to have done this uh, with the World Affairs Council and uh, glad to be partners with them in so many, in so many things. I think Mark Twain himself would have been really proud of this evening's conversation. <laughs> so thank you both so much. Yes, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer, nice to see you, Barbara. Yeah, you too. And thanks all for, for your donations tonight. Um, we appreciate it very much. So we'll see you next time. Thank you for being here. Good night. Good night.